Happy Wednesday! It is 2.50 on Wednesday afternoon and I'm here with your Wednesday video and this is the market revolution. And before I can tell you how things change, you have to know how things were before the change happens. And that's called the moral economy. This is going to be a pre-capitalist society. This is going to be what was existing in the American colonies and the early United States in the 17th and the 18th centuries. And what you would find is that crops are grown for self-sufficiency, or subsistence, I should say. So you're only going to be growing crops and growing food for your own family use. Maybe you're going to give a little bit of food to your neighbors, but that's it. Uh, goods and services are going to be traded with your neighbors. Um, there's no big corporations or anything like that. And there's this idea of personal credit. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, this was found in a lot of places, especially New England. Um, storekeepers or people in general would keep diaries or account books that would detail transactions. And if somebody got in debt too deeply, then very often those debts would either be lessened or forgiven completely. In the moral economy, men and women have very different duties. Uh, women are responsible for the keeping of the inside of the house. They're responsible for the cooking, food preservation, tending to gardens, poultry, dairy animals, and making textiles. And that means all parts of textiles. The, the spinning, the weaving, the dyeing, the quilting, you name it. Men, uh, their job is to tend to the field crops, livestock, build buildings, chop firewood, hunt, fish, and repair buildings. You basically have two different family economies that work together. One economy is managed by the husband, the other economy is managed by the wife. Now, I have the name Martha Ballard here. Uh, she's one of the best examples of this moral economy. Uh, she lived in Maine uh, with her husband Ephraim, and she lived from 1735 until 1812. And when Martha Ballard, she moved to the city of Hallowell, Maine, she became the town's midwife. In other words, she was the one who people went to uh, for assistance in birthing their children. Now, she left a diary. Her diary has been compiled into a book called A Midwife's Tale, The Life of Martha Ballard, based on her diaries. Um, we don't have this at the West Georgia Tech Library, but it is available at the public library, and you can get it through... Um, interlibrary loan. But what this is, it's a 10,000 entry diary that stretches over 25 years. And from her diary, we know everything she did. Like she baked and she brewed drinks, she pickled and she preserved food, she made soap, she made candles, she spun and wove cloth. We also know that she was a trusted healer and midwife in her family. And in her 25 years, she delivered personally 816 children and then was present at the birth of almost a thousand more. So she was either directly responsible or present for the birth of nearly 2,000 young babies. <clears throat> now eventually things are, things are going to change and that's where this market economy develops. This is going to be early capitalism. And it's going to develop in the late 1700s and early 1800s. And money is going to become more important. This idea of profit is going to drive society. Uh, for example, people are going to start growing stuff and producing stuff specifically to sell. And whatever profits they make are going to be used to purchase goods from somebody else. Now to do this market style economy, you have to have this thing called specialization of labor. And I'm going to walk you kind of through how that happens here in a minute. So some of the factors that lead to this change from the moral to the market economy. You have early industrialization, and that's going to begin with the textile mills. During the 1700s, most clothes are made in the home, such as like they were with Martha Ballard. But eventually you start getting to this putting out system or this cottage system. And what would happen is a mill owner would get some wool and he would have that wool turned into thread. Then he would give the thread to local women in the community. Those women would turn the thread into cloth. After it was turned into cloth, the mill owner would then buy the finished cloth from the women. 
and then the mill owner would turn it into clothing. Now eventually these mill owners realize that it's, it makes more sense to have the women come to him instead of sending the stuff out to the women. That has nothing to do with, with uh, women being lesser or, or these men being superior or anything like that. It was simply that if the women came to the mill, then the owner of the mill could supervise their work. The women working in their own home could work on their own time. If the women, if their work was due on Sunday night at 11.59 p.m., these women might wait until 10.59 p.m. to start their week's worth of work. However, if the women have to come to the men and into the mill, then the mill owner can watch the women and make sure that they get their work done immediately. My, that might sound a little too close to home for some, just saying. Other mills are going to have journeymen who cut the fabric and tailors who create the suits or the clothing. Now when we get to 1790, some of the mills are going to begin relying on water-powered machines like power looms and spinning jennies, and that's going to create the threads quicker. I'm going to go back one screen here. Two screens, I'm sorry. This is a picture of a spinning jenny. If you're ever curious what one looks like. Basically, instead of just having one person make one spool of thread, a spinning jenny can make dozens of spools at one time. And you can see that back here. Those are all the spools of thread being created. Okay. Now, as steam power becomes common in the 1840s, these mills can be pretty much anywhere. The original water-powered mills have to be near running water because there's got to be a water wheel that spins the machines. Steam power means that you can put a mill anywhere you can get water to you. So steam power is going to allow industrialization to expand. The best example of this industrialization is the Waltham system of Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, in 1813, the Boston Manufacturing Company, owned by a guy named Francis Cabot Lowell, is going to open the first water-powered factory in the country. And this is a large factory. It's the first time that all the parts of production are brought under one roof, all the spinning, all the weaving, all the cutting, you name it. And the cloth that this factory is going to produce is so cheap that nobody wants to make their own cloth anymore. It's kind of like today, you know, we don't all want to raise cows because it's easier to go to the grocery store and buy a steak. Now a lot of the women who work in these mills are young. They can be as young as six or, you know, average late teens. And there are two readings this week. Uh, there's the Lowell Mill Girls and the Female Workers of Lowell who really tell you what it was like for these people. Now, Lowell was seen as a model community. The mill owners, they provide for the women uh, places to live, places to relax. They give them prepared meals. They give them places to go to church. But as you read in those readings, it's not all it, it's cracked up to be. A lot of the women only work for a couple of years. They leave the mill when they get married because it's seen that a married woman should not work. And a lot of the workers are from New England farms, and the money they owe or they earn is not for them, it's for their male relatives. And the male work, mill workers are going to take advantage of these women pretty much any way they can. They're going to try to speed up production, they're going to try and you know, pay them as little as possible. And in a lot of ways, this mill system is going to lead to the first labor unions. And technology is going to be a big part of this. Now, that whole Waltham system, that is a technology, of course, but that kind of fit better with the textiles. So, um, some other technologies. There's this idea of interchangeable parts. In July of 1801, Eli Whitney, yes, the same Eli Whitney who invents the cotton gin, came up with this idea of interchangeable parts. Basically, he would use precision machinery to produce identical parts, replica parts, that could be re used as replacements at lower costs. And it's kind of like today, you know, if your car breaks, if your headlight goes out, you don't buy a new car, you just buy a whole new, you just buy a new headlight. Or if your battery goes bad, you don't 
get rid of the car you just get a new battery well before you lie whitney comes up with this idea of interchangeable parts of the machine broke you through the entire machine out instead of just fixing the one screw that was missing when eli whitney comes up with this idea of an interchangeable parts it's going to lower the cost of production because you no longer have to replace the entire machine you can just replace parts of the machines another technology is the is transportation roads you don't think of those as being a technology but they actually are uh, the road construction is improved canals are built as well the most famous canal here in the United States was the Erie Canal. I've seen it. It's, it's okay. It's not as big as you would think, but I guess for the 1800s it was pretty big. But the Erie Canal was built in upstate New York between 1817 and 1825. It cost about $7 million in 1825 money to create. And it connected New York City with the Great Lakes. Uh, boats could come into New York Harbor sail up the Hudson River, get to around Syracuse, New York, and then use the Hudson River to, or the, <clears throat> the Erie Canal to go from the Hudson River over to um, Lake Erie. And <clears throat> why was this so important? Well, it led to the creation and the rise of cities like Milwaukee and Chicago. Now, if you've never been to Milwaukee, it's actually pretty big. It's bigger than Atlanta is. And Chicago is the third biggest city in the country. It also made it super cheap to send stuff. Now and then, water shipping or shipping in, on the ocean is the absolute cheapest way to send stuff. And freight prices were cut from $100 a ton before the Erie Canal to $9 a ton after the Erie Canal. And then you have railroads. Railroads begin around 1830. By 1850, there's about 9,000 miles of track laid in the, in the United States. And 10 years later, and by 1860, there are over 30,000 miles of railroad track. Now, most of these lines fail to connect to another. Um, you have to do a lot of offloading and onloading and make deals to get railroad connections. But what it did do, it gave a year-round all-weather system of transportation. And that's going to really lead to some development after the, the Civil War. Steamships begin to replace sailing ships. They're quicker and they're larger and they can get things there cheaper and faster. And then we have Samuel Morse, who envelops or develops both the telegraph and Morse code. Now the telegraph is important because it provided nearly real-time communication. Um, before the telegraph to get news from New York to London could take three to four months. After the telegraph, six minutes. Our world got a little smaller and the telegraph was kind of like the internet of the day. This also meant that news could travel faster and the telegraph is what creates modern journalism. Okay, urbanization and migration. Before I tell you about this, got to do your, your secret word of the day. Today's secret word is court, C-O-U-R-T. Uh, I don't know if you noticed or not, but the Supreme Court handed down a very important and long overdue court decision. Um, look it up. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I want you to do a little research. But take a look at what the Supreme Court did this week. And that's going to be your word of the day, court, C-O-U-R-T. Okay, so urbanization and migration. Um, cities begin to expand and cities become extra important during this time. Uh, New York City becomes the main port of the country and it becomes the main financial center of the country. That's why the New York Stock Exchange is there now and why Wall Street is there now. Uh, Savannah is also one of the most important cities in the country at the time and it is becoming increasingly important today as well. And these urban centers, uh, places like Philadelphia, New York, Boston, even Savannah, uh, they become places for financing, banking, and big investment. Uh, there's also migration that's going to make these cities grow. Uh, the Irish come over to the United States in large numbers in 1840 due to the potato famine. Uh, in 1846, the potato crop in Ireland falls, which was 
a huge deal because it was literally the only crop they grew. And when the Irish potato famine hits, there's a huge lack of employment and a huge increase in deaths. And the Irish, they leave Ireland to kind of get, uh, get rid of any bad stuff that could happen to them. In fact, I've read somewhere that there are more Irish in America than there are actually in Ireland. Uh, Germany. Uh, Germans, even though there's no such thing as a Germany per se, but people, ethnic Germans, start to come to America in the 1850s because of these failed revolutions. In European history, 1848 is a year of revolution, and in some places in 1848, the revolutions work, and in some they don't. And in most of the German kingdoms, most of the German countries, they do not work. So your choice is stay, and if you supported the revolution, die, or escape and go somewhere new. Then last but not least, you also have internal migration. People start going from the countryside to the city for work and for jobs. Corporations are formed and they become private entities. Corporations are no longer government run, but the government is still investing in business, especially state governments who are investing in both transportation and banking. All right, so that's your quick little lecture on uh, the market revolution. I want to show you this. This is our course lesson plan, just to remind you where we are. We are currently on week number four, which is right here. That's week number four. Your second reflection paper is due Sunday night at midnight. Just a quick reminder, you can do anything from lesson five, lesson six, lesson seven, lesson eight. That is a reading. That's a sign. For your reflection paper, make sure your first paragraph is just a short summary of that reading and the next page and a half or so is how you feel about that reading. Like take common sense for example, I agree with everything Thomas Paine said, I, I hate Thomas Paine, I hate this reading, I love this reading, whatever it might be. Tell me how you feel, your personal reflection, don't research anything, a reflection paper should be your opinion, your reflection based on that reading. Next week is your midterm exam. I'm going to try and get a, a uh, study guide out Sunday or Saturday night maybe. Also start thinking about your museum review. That's going to be due at the end of the semester, but start thinking what museum website you want to look at. Or maybe you want to watch a historical movie, go ahead and do that and get that out of the way. And then last but not least, when we come back after the midterm, I'm going to start talking about the, the research paper. So over the next week or so, just start thinking about who or what in American history you want to research and learn more about. That way when I start talking about it, you can get started on your research and start working on, on your paper. Now there will be no video for next week since it is only the midterm exam. The midterm exam will open up Monday morning at 12 a.m. and it will close that next Sunday at 11.59 p.m. So it'll be a little bit of time before you hear from me. I'm sure you're not going to be heartbroken over that. But if you need to reach me, you can get me either through email or Discord. Have a good week. We'll talk to you later.